We're having a beautiful day in the neighborhood. We're meeting Richard Jewell, and we're going to take a road trip with Queen and Slim and visit the lighthouse. I'm Van Connor. I'm Bex Perfect, and this is Off Screen, your seven day guide to everything movies. Boom. Welcome to Off Screen. Let's get cinematic. Let's get cinematic. Do you know what? This week mm-hmm. is actually a, a better week. It's a damn good week, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, there's Oof. strong stuff here this week. Okay, I'm gonna, can we start off then with what I think is going to be the most divisive film of the week? Uh, yes, you may. Okay, all right. <laughs> so, so this is The Lighthouse, right? So this is the new film from Robert Eggers. Now, this apparently started life as an attempt to adapt uh, the work of Edgar Allan Poe. And it stars uh, Willem Dafoe, it stars Robert Pattinson, and nobody else. It's those two on an island in black and white in four by three ratio. It is the 18th century, 18th, 19th century. Uh, it is the time of the old sea captain. You know, that, that kind There's of There's a lot time. of people smoking pipes and not yeah. really smoking anything. It's just having a pipe in their mouth. Lots of woolly jumpers and big bushy beards. You yeah. know, that, that kind of a time. It, they, are the, they are the two Grumpy wickies. men. Grumpy men. Well, they would be because... They're saying, stuck on a... Hang on, wait. Yeah. Two men on a lighthouse on their own. Yeah. There should be three. There should be three? Yes. Is this because you saw that movie with Gerard Butler last year, by any chance? Because yes. I thought of that as well. Yes. Yes, with yes. Peter Mullen so the and I, Gerard Butler. But it is a common thing, I think, with it lighthouses, is. that if you always need three people at a lighthouse, mm. because if something happens, you then have another witness. Well, that's very true. Yeah. Well, so they're, they're called wikis. As I learned a lot about lighthouse keeping from this movie. <laughs> they're called wikis. Okay. Not, not in reference to the, the online encyclopedia, obviously. Yeah. Um, they, you know, the old veteran, played by uh, Defoe, you've got the younger young sort of... He's kind of a drifter. He's, he's someone with a sort of a mysterious past in that he's drifted from job to job and there's something not quite there about him. He's played by Robert Pattinson, a.k.a. future Batman, uh, which started filming this week. Yes, yes, I know. And, uh, Saw that clapperboard. There's a whole thing whereby uh, Willem Dafoe's rather more, more seasoned veteran has a superstitious belief that if you kill a seagull, it's bad luck because seagulls are the reincarnated souls of deceased sailors and they will bring the wrath of hell upon you. Uh, have a guess what Robert Pattinson then goes and does. Go on. Yeah, well, he kills a seagull, doesn't he? And oh, then... for goodness <laughs> sake. I know, dumb, dumb. Is this the basis of the film? Th- this is the basis of the film. <laughs> All right. uh, there's then a massive storm that traps them within the island, prevents them from making their window of leaving the island, and wouldn't you know it, they start to lose their minds. What you gonna do? Will you kill me? Will you... Will you kill me like you done that gull? I did! Liar! You murdering dog! Twas ye what changed the wind on us! Twas ye what damned us, dog! Twas ye! Will you do what you wished you'd done to old Winslow? Will you best me then? For Winslow were right! Thomas, you're a dog! A filthy dog! A dog! Willem Dafoe, ladies and gentlemen, on fine form. You're a dog! I a dog. love Willem Dafoe. He's gone. He's gone full uh, sea captain from The Simpsons on this one. Yard and R, says I. Nice. Yeah. But uh, I quite like the performances in this. I think they're superb. I think uh, Willem Dafoe is on fine form as always. When is Willem Dafoe ever not great? Yeah, exactly. And uh, it's, it's kind of shocking to me, given the uh, the kudos he got for uh, the, the Van Gogh performance last year. I didn't actually see that one, so I'm not, I couldn't comment. But I, I'm a big fan of him. And do you know what? I, I read a lot about the theatre work he used to do mm. back in the, I think, the 70s, in fact. You know, his grafting as an actor yeah. and his dedication to the roles mm-hmm. are quite incredible. And actually, we should talk a little bit about Robert Pattinson as well, because, yes, you know, out of his Twilight mm. fame, you know, he's managed to scupper being typecast in those kind of, by picking, like, really interesting roles, you know, from uh, David... Oh, what was his... Oh, was David Cronenberg's David Cosmopolis. Yeah, Cosmopolis, yes. you know, things like that, that you, you know, he knew probably wouldn't be commercially savvy to do, but will mm. start establishing him as a better actor, a more respected actor that will then lead to bigger things. We're going to have a similar conversation about another British actor later in this in this exact segment, not more yeah. the next segment. But, uh, I mean, I will say, I, I really dug this movie, but I didn't in any way did enjoy you, it. Did you... 
I was going to say, did you dig it? Because of the, the feedback that I've heard about mm-hmm. this is that yeah. it's bonkers. It is bonkers. It yeah. is absolutely right. So I, I had to write this down because I was trying to articulate exactly how to describe the film. So imagine one hour and 49 minutes, okay, of the works of David Cronenberg, the collected works of David Cronenberg, being battered around the head with a big encyclopedic volume of Edgar Allan Poe, whilst Willem Dafoe does the whole sea captain from The Simpsons voice and constantly farts his way through. I mean, literally. <laughs> This is the literal definition, as James King brilliantly puts it, of artsy-fartsy. Right. Um, and, and all the while, Robert Patterson just looks on wide-eyed, lip-trembling. He's and, got quite the right face mm. to do all of that, I think, yeah. as well. And of course, you know, four by three ratio, black and white. It is absolutely deranged. It is not in any way for everyone. It is really out there. I'm not sure if I'd like it. Oh, I, I say, it's it's not a date movie. Let's put it that way. You wouldn't buy popcorn before you saw it, to put it that way. It, it, it's yeah. But is it like... Is it so out there and artsy fartsy and mm. ridiculous that actually someone will go, This would never happen. This is bizarre. It is about two men just gradually losing their minds. And as a portrait of that, it works very, very well. Okay, okay, say. but someone losing their mind, right? Let's let's take this back. Yeah. Joker, for instance. Oh, it's no Joker. In terms of it's in no terms Joker. of how accessible it is. Joker is a lot more accessible a movie. Mm-hmm. This is a lot more in the art house uh, realm. Okay. Yeah, so you take from that what you will. For my money, it's a thumb and a half up, but that half is based entirely on, you know what, this is so deranged, I kind of have to respect and love it. Okay. Yeah, you know what I mean? One of those. Yeah. So on to something a little bit more mainstream then. Yeah. Because I know you've seen this one as well, so it's Richard Jewell. This oh, week, so as yes. Well. Now, it, yeah. So okay. plot of Richard Jewell, Smith, Miss Perfect. Okay, so the plot of Richard Jewell, it's about a guy called Richard Jewell. Imaginatively um, enough. Who is, um, <laughs> he's, he's kind of like your busboy, I think, in a way, for like um, initially for uh, an, uh, an office, a solicitor's office, where he meets yes. Sam Rockwell's but character. Is um, it a mailman or something? Yeah, that's the thing. Yeah. Like the busboy, like he kind of just does a little gopher. bit of, yeah, he's your gopher. Mm. And then he leaves that job and he kind of does security. He's got these passions about being and these aspirations about being in the police force, in the yes. FBI. He's got a bit of an obsession about that. But he's like a very unassuming, very normal guy, lives with his mum, played by the brilliant Kathy Bates. Who's Oscar nominated for Oscar this. Oscar nominated yeah. for this. And essentially what happens is that he's um, security at a big festival. I think it's, it's, the, it's the Kenny Rogers. It's the Kenny Rogers concert that's at, at the 1996 yeah. Atlanta, uh, Atlanta Olympics. Yeah, so this is all a true story. Okay, mm. It's all completely based on a true story. And he notices a backpack yeah. Um, near a crowd of people and he kind of goes we need to get these people out right well and this thing isn't because it, it's played as a sort of overzealous overcautious I'm the man who knows everything will save the world kind of, kind yeah. of bit it's isn't intense it? yeah. in that respect yeah. and he manages to get everyone out and a bomb goes off and he saves a lot of people doing that right but then because he's probably I hate to say it like more of a simple character mm, in some yeah. respects he is, he's kind of a schlub, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, he's kind of taken advantage of by the media, a few things like that, who hail him as a hero, but then offer him things like slots on a morning program, mm-hmm. offer him potential book deals, things like that. And then suddenly people start asking questions and going, well, knowing who he is and knowing his aspirations to be wanted and, and you know used in a professional capacity, is there actually something that he may have planted mm. this bomb yeah. to make himself look good? So this is what this is what happens when that kind of suspicion takes place. The media has portrayed my son as the person who has committed this crime. They have taken all privacy from us. They have taken all peace. The FBI follows his every move and watches my home constantly. And why? My son My son is innocent. Mr. President, please clear my son's name. So, yeah. okay, just to give you a little taste of that, because uh. and, and basically, I mean, I ended up Googling what happened to the real Richard Jewell. Doesn't he look... Paul Walter Hauser, who plays yes. Richard Jewell, actually does physically. And I don't Looks mean they've, like made him, yeah. him, they've not made him up to look like that. He actually does bear an uncanny resemblance yeah, too. Yeah, he really does. Mm. And I think, you know, the, 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 the essentially, this isn't really a spoiler, but it's part of the factual history about this, is that, that he spent 88 days holed up in his house with yeah. his mum because of the police interference and also the media and yeah. everything. And this is not a well man, you know. This no. is a guy who has a lot of sort of medical problems that, you know, it, it doesn't bode well for him. And it's a sad, sad, tale a tale which i think if i'm being completely honest 
is quite compelling. No, it is. It is a compelling tale. I think I, I have issues with the direction they've gone with it. Yes, that's what that's what yeah. I mean. It's a compelling tale, mm. executed. I'm not sure in a way that I thought was keeping my attention. Which ably made, because it's mm. Clint Eastwood yeah. directing, and Clint Eastwood can make a film. Yeah. It does weirdly uh, sort of line up with another recent Clint Eastwood film. What was the one with Tom Hanks where he played Sully? Oh, it was Sully. It was Sully. It was Sully. <laughs> it yeah. lines up with and Sully. I like in Sully. That, that yeah. hero then being accused of... But yeah. Sully had more drama about it. Yes, it right? did, When you're it? talking about a plane crash, things mm-hmm. like that, you know, big investigations, that's going to work. What doesn't work for here is a guy being holed up in his house for 88 days, you know, and I, I thought the police were despicable in this and I thought that that didn't really work very well. But Sam Rockwell was great. The guy that played Richard Jules was great. Kathy Bates is great. Mm-hmm. Good actors. Not as good a script. Not as good a script. And there is some minor controversy around the things done with Olivia Wilde's character because uh, oh, yeah. that reporter is not with us anymore mm. and notably isn't around to address the, uh, let's just say, numerous falsities that have been written into her depiction here. Mm. It is frankly astounding. And actually, Olivia Wilde's getting a lot of blame for that. It is strange. I think yeah. it's because Olivia Wilde is perceived to be kind of so... Uh, perceived to be so perceptive mm. in, in her own way she she has well, quite she's a, a director now in her that's own it, right isn't it? and well, also so. she's perceived to be quite woke quite yeah. in touch with you know the reality of these things that it does seem and it seems odd to me as well that she would do it the film drops the ball rather significantly as regards especially in this day and age as regards assigning the blame that's actually owed to the media in this story. Mm. I think to... There's in, a lot of vilification of the police force in this. There is, but not the media. And yeah. you think that's really strange because it is the media that fueled this. Yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm old enough to remember this happening. And also, I can't quite shake the feeling that we are watching a film by one of the oldest working Hollywood Republicans that is about hmm. an evil white lady ruining the life of a working class right wing mm. white, white man yeah and that that sticks with i came away from the film thinking i, I can't right. yeah. shake that I, I i just keep thinking of clint eastwood talking to the empty chair and it just it it unsettles me having said that it's a one one thumb up from me absolutely. yeah i'd give it one i i lost my patience with it i actually switched it off oh, one yeah. thumb no thumbs uh, when i say switched it off i walked out <laughs> um, you know but in, uh, i, I switched mean that off and then i switched off and i kind of you know i popped to the loo got mm. some popcorn you know that kind of thing and yeah. just yeah it didn't really work for me Welcome back to Off Screen. So we've had a bonkers situation in a lighthouse and a guy that's holed up in his own house for 88 days. Oof, that was solid. <laughs> Do you know what Bex. I think we need now? Go on. I think we need a beautiful day in the neighbourhood. Everybody needs a beautiful day in the neighbourhood. <laughs> like my really segue. Yes. You, you are a segue queen. I know, right? Award season doesn't feel like award season to me without Tom Hanks <laughs> getting really some doesn't, sort doesn't of it. nod. <laughs> so welcome back, Tom Hanks. It's yes. good to have you back in the fold. Um, he's been nominated for his role of Fred Rogers. Um, he's been nominated as a best supporting um oscar uh, best supporting actor role for the uh, oscar here this is a film based on a true story uh, it documents an unlikely friendship between an investigative journalist and also a, uh, yeah, a national treasure should we mm. say um an iconic children's tv presenter from yesteryear so between the 1970s to the 1990s in which this film is set and the interesting thing about this is that this investigative journalist played by matthew reese goes in thinking this guy can't be a saint You know, he's got to have some dirt about him. And actually, he ends up uncovering a lot of things about himself. This uh, piece will be for an issue about heroes. Do you consider yourself a hero? I don't think of myself as a hero. No, not at all. What about Mr. Rogers? Is he a hero? I I don't understand the question. Well, there's you, Fred, and then there's the character you play, Mr. Rogers. You said it was a play at the plate. Is that, is that what, is that what happened to you? I, I'm, I'm here to interview you, Mr. Rogers. Well, that is what we're doing, isn't it? Yep, Matthew Reese there with, uh, with Tom Hanks and, oh my God, that voice. Oh. Uh. Can I just ask? The soothing voice. Yeah, can I just ask, from, from the way you've just described Fred Rogers, because mm. uh, I didn't want to cut you off because the flow was so good. Because you know I'd hit you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't want things thrown at me. Um, do, you, do you personally not have any sort of experience of Mr. Rogers as, no. a, as an entertainer? Oh, okay. Zero. Be- because I know you've, you've, see, you've been around the world like I have. <laughs> I thought you were like, you've been around since the uh, 1970s. <laughs> no, you've, you've been around the world in, in, your, uh, you know, in your formative years as I have. And, yeah. And, and, and that's the thing. I, I, I have some first-hand experience with Mr. Rogers. And obviously when the documentary came out a couple of years ago, I won't 
Won't You Be My Neighbour? Uh, I was gobsmacked. It was a beautiful documentary, by the way. Oh, I, I must it, catch that. It I'm... is on Prime or Netflix. I'll have to look that up. Oh, look, check, check. Likewise. There you yeah, go. Check there likewise we go. that one. Um, check likewise. Um, I think if. Yeah, likewise. Um, find that documentary. It is absolutely beautiful and it reduced me to rubble. And then this film also reduced me to rubble. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Because it didn't reduce me to rubble. Oh, okay. The whole thing is, I think there is a cultural element whereby if you know, for, if you have that first time experience of Mr. Rogers, who was to, a, not even a generation, but several generations of children, mostly American children, admittedly, was just this saintly sort of grandparent figure. Yeah. And the whole thing with him, as the, as you know from this film, yeah. was always, come on, that can't be real. He's got to be a piece of work outside of this. And he's not. The do- the whole documentary was about, no, no, really, this this was the guy. Yeah. And who do you get for that but Tom Hanks? The know, minute right? this guy was cast. Yeah, you it knew. works. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, everything about that that element of it works. The mm. casting, I mean, it's centered around Tom Hanks and Matthew Reese. That mm. is that is the key thing that you need to see in this because that dynamic has to work. I I think the the jarringness for me is I I didn't know who he was. Yeah. And I think if you're going into it, do you care as much? Whereas yeah. for you to have had any sort of inkling of mm. of who Fred Rogers is is like, well, I've seen this firsthand. So I had to go and look him up yeah. afterwards. Right. So, and and, the, and you didn't get immediately pointed to the documentary, which is annoying because that documentary yeah. should be so much more popular I got more than it Wikipedia. is. Wikipedia. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but actually, do you know what? I like the way this film was set. Mm. I like it, how it was made. I felt it. I didn't get as absorbed in it, maybe in the same way as Richard Jewell as as as, as, uh, as this film, because again, it's it's two people. It's it's quite yeah. insular in that respect. And um, there's a lot of insular films out this week. The Very Lighthouse much. is insular, you know. <laughs> Richard Jewell's That's literally is insular. insular. Yeah. yeah. Um, and and for this, I think it is performance based, which I can't fault. But uh, what I did like about it, so the opener for it, the way they contrived essentially the set of Mr. Rogers' show. That's a to... question for, I have for you, actually. Okay. If you don't know Mr. Rogers... Sorry, please continue on that point. I'll, yeah, I'll ask you, after, you, so you, all right, sorry. cutting me off every... Uh... <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I'm excited uh, about this movie. That's I know, it but it's interesting that you are because I was a bit sort of like take it or leave it in mm, a way. Okay. Um, so, yeah, the set I thought was was interesting. Like, So when I think back to my childhood, I'm thinking things like play days and stuff like that. You know, it is that basic set. Yeah. It is that kind of someone is walking you through. It's very simple. It's in standard definition. You know, the bar, you see those black bars on the screen, like, yeah. you know, really sort of honing in on, on, on that kind of element of the feature. And it's... Um, it works for me and it's a bit surreal and when mm. you're going from Pittsburgh to New York yep. you're doing it via a model it, exactly um, sort of cardboard city. yeah cardboard uh, cut out yeah thing. and I loved that very quirky very mm. cute um, you know who directed this of course this is uh, I know the name uh, this is Marielle Heller yeah and Marielle Heller, of course, gave us The Diary of a Teenage Girl a few years ago, which is a yes. film I'm very fond of. Yeah, so she she actually gave us a few things, which yes. I, I, I was looking it up afterwards, actually, mm. and, and uh, it escapes me at the top of my head right now. <laughs> but I do remember looking at that going, oh, interesting. And that, so for that reason, I can kind of see why Tom Hanks brought into the idea of doing this. Um, for a British audience, so that's where I'm coming at with this, okay? Yeah. For a British audience who don't know about this, I'm trying to think who would be our equivalent. Uh, Daryl Morris and I had this conversation last yeah. night and believe it or not and this comes with all sorts of really horrible connotations, the closest thing we could come up with. Don't say. Yeah, you know who it is. Chris um, Aaron. No, no, actually it was it was Jimmy Savile was the closest mm. thing we could come up with and then we're like, no, let's not use that. What about Rolf Harris? And we're like, okay, let's not use that one either. And it just turns out that yeah, yeah the American... Project E-Trees had its... Uh... Yeah, the American one was a saint. Our equivalents infinitely less so maybe that is why it's because you can't associate with someone over here that can do it maybe that is why i'm finding it jarring marielle heller directed can you ever forgive me last year yeah that's why and i forgot that as well yeah wow yeah but uh die of a teenage girl though absolute dynamite and i i, I fell in love with bell powley in that film yeah he's brilliant, brilliant in the morning show as well she is isn't she yeah so look i i mean going back to this particular film i think it's there are things to note of this. I think, mm. as you know, the fact that it's a true story, the fact that you know there was the the journalist has an, a difficult relationship with his father, you know, and comes into this, and the kind of therapeutic mm. result of meeting Mister Rogers is sweet, is very sweet. But for me, it doesn't work in the sense that 
I cared didn't, enough. You didn't have the cultural attack. I didn't know, and I think that's a real problem for anyone going so, to see it over here. Thumbs up, thumbs down from you. Then. I'm gonna give it a one thumbs up. Yeah, one I think. thumbs up. Oh, okay. Interestingly, I was gonna give it two. Well, no, but that so, makes sense. Let's say right? that there's an entire thumb that's yeah. owed to cult. I think to cultural attachment. I think it's important in that. this respect. Though. I think so. I think there is there. So let's go on to one that I know you're raring to talk about, and we've got I think just under four minutes to talk about it. Well, that's so, not enough time. It's it's not, is it? Because I could talk about it for days. Yeah. Take us through Queen and Slim. Okay, so Queen and Slim, where do I start? So this is almost essentially a Bonnie and Clyde style film. Oh, it's, yeah. It's the story of a young black couple who on a first date get pulled over by a policeman over a minor traffic violation. The situation then massively escalates and Slim, played by the brilliant Daniel Kaluuya, he ends up grabbing the gun of the policeman and shooting him dead. And they essentially go on the run, Bonnie and Clyde style. However, it's not to do with just them. It's about how the video from the dash cam footage yeah. turns into this social media phenomenon and pretty much most of the southern states get behind them and this situation. You're a black man that killed a cop and then took his gun. I'm not a criminal. You are now. I just want to go home, and I want to see my family. If you turn yourself in, you will never see them again. All we can do is go forward. There is nothing back there for us. Please, let's just keep going. Jodie Turner-Smith and Daniel Cooley are there. I mean, this is going to be the film that launches Jodie Turner-Smith's career in I film. think so. I didn't recognise her. And I, uh, I I looked her up on this afterwards. It turned out I'd been watching her for two seasons on The Last Ship, which <laughs> is an otherwise basically unseen in this country Michael Bay action series. Right. Uh, which is exactly as ridiculous as it sounds. My mother loves it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but Daniel Cullier, when we were talking about Pattinson earlier and hey, this career, this progression, in interesting career path he's on, Daniel Cullier, un I think he's in a league of his own as far as picking zeitgeisty, introspective, interesting projects that are also always entertaining. And even things like Get Out. Yeah. Get Out was in no way a sure thing. No. And then you look at just everything. I mean, it's Sicario even. Do you know what? I um, I interviewed Daniel back in the day no, uh, for... Um, say Psychoville. Please say Psychoville. No, it's for that... Um, what's that Rowan Atkinson? Um, Johnny, uh, Johnny, Johnny English. English film, right. So back in the day, right, so, you know, Daniel Kaluuya probably getting a bit part in this. Mm. And you knew from the start that he's a grafter. Mm -hmm. And that chilled look and persona that he gives off, it's like he doesn't have to act because that is him. It is that, but also he can weaponize that. You look yeah. at look at his turn in Widows last yeah. year, which I yeah, think yeah. was the most underrated film of last yeah. year. Uh, disagree, but I okay. guess. Do you think? Okay. Um, well, we can we can okay, argue. No. We can argue again on Four Oscar minutes, night. Don't forget. Sorry, sorry. We'll argue. <laughs> we'll argue that again on Oscar night. But the way he weaponized his his calm, his, mm. his demeanor in Widows, I, and it's brilliant that here he seems to strike a very fine balance between that menacing calm and the earnest likability that he has otherwise. Yeah. I think he genuinely is one of the best performers around currently. 100%. And like you say, this will put Jodie Turner-Smith on the map. Yeah. She's equally impressive in her own way. But let's not just talk about the acting in this mm -hmm. because I think as a film as a whole, yes. this is amazing. So there's something in this that I really loved and it's the use of moving portraits, okay? Yeah, and, 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 and I just want to point out the cinematography because we don't always have time to talk about it but I think here you need to. It This film gives you everything from like gentle laughs when it needs to have a moment lightened you know mm -hmm. the, the Uncle Earl is a great character yes. to do that with Bakeem Woodbine yeah. I, I couldn't help but think is aging too well for too this well. part too well because the man's got to be in his late 50s by yeah. now but he looks so good he looks like 45 still you've got you've got your heart heart in the mouth moments as well like the chases oh, like, yes. I'm, I'm going to have to say the ending as well is, mm. is quite incredible and then you've got those moments like that you will be sobbing in and, and, and we walked out and there were a number of critics sobbing at the end of this um <laughs> Um, and the thing is about this is that it has everything a great film needs yeah. and, it, and more. And it's an underrated film. And it's a shame because this, particularly with all the controversy over the BAFTAs and the Oscars and everything, it's a film like this that should have had the yes. backing to get the nominations and to get the recognition. I absolutely agree. Yeah. Absolutely 100%. Uh, thumbs up, thumbs down from you. Do you know what? On that note, yeah. I would say I would encourage you to show your support for this film and actually go and watch it this weekend because this is the type of film that makes great cinema. So that, that two, two thumbs? thumbs up from me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> for my money, it's politically poignant. It's powerful. Yeah. It's moving. And I even found it quite romantic at times. Two yeah. very glowing thumbs up. Yeah. I agree with Bex wholeheartedly. 
everybody should go and see Queen Inslet. And now it's time for that section of the show we like to call Off Screen Pays the Bills. Hey, Bex. Oh, yes, it's bill paying time. <laughs> and you know what? Really happy about this one because we get to talk about Likewise again. Oh, yes. Love Likewise. Yes, I actually am a big fan. Have you been Have you been using it? I've been, I've been going on and actually reading some of the yeah. recommendations. Yeah, do you know what? It's such a cool app to mm. discover kind of what you need to watch or read next. I think it's really intuitive in that kind mm. of respect. So it's a super cool app that we we are big fans of. Yep. Well, this is the thing because we, we get to use the website as well. Yeah. You can go to uh, you can go to uh, uh, likewise.com, go on the website, or you can download the app from the App Store or Google Play. And it basically it's basically communal recommendations. Yeah, exactly. So uh, like platform. your friends, your family, mm. all that kind of stuff, getting yeah. recommendations for what to watch next. That makes it more community based, as you said. You know what I really like as well. It has if you if you're doing the films thing, which is this is big for me, obviously, and you. Uh, when we get like recommended a film, we select the film on the platform. Like oh, we get recommended that we can look that, and it tells you what streaming platforms the, yeah. the ads are actually the films are actually available. Amazing, on, isn't it? Which yeah. is really cool i kind of like that because that's something where everyone always asks you like, oh, where can i watch that film and you're like i don't know offhand like I'm, i've not got the rolodex in my head yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. i get that yeah totally <laughs> but it, it learns it has the algorithm that learns what you like and it again recommends very very intuitive based on it so yeah so uh check out the likewise app uh in the app store or on google play or visit the website at likewise.com discover what to watch or read next And we're back, and this time we're getting cinematic on the small screen. So, Miss Perfect, should we uh, should we take it to the couch and see what's on Freeview for you know the what? week? Uh, yeah, we've got some interesting ones this week. <laughs> it's a mixed bag, um, isn't it? It is a mixed bag. You want to start off, off on a Saturday on More 4 at 9 o'clock with, an, with an, a documentary. Yeah. Three I, Identical Strangers. I wouldn't ordinarily pitch a documentary. No, but, I'm, I'm surprised uh, that we've added this to our list. Yeah, this is so bonkers. Okay. Okay, so this is obviously a documentary, so obviously a true Wait story. Wait a minute, wasn't this on Netflix? Is it about three brothers? Uh, it is about three brothers. So the idea is a guy goes to college yeah. in like the late 70s everyone starts recognizing him he has no idea why and it turns out that prior to him starting that that freshman year at college yeah. he had a doppelganger who had dropped out turns out to be his twin brother who he'd been separated from at birth they become national news they meet they become national news and they then find out there's a third one and then they become big on the talk show circuit and then they find out they weren't the only ones there were others as well they're trying to conceal what they did from the people they did it to. When you play with humans, you do something very wrong. It would be evil enough to come up with something like this. There's a lot of powerful people that would like to have this story silenced. There's still so much that we don't know. It boggles the mind. It's a mystery. I'd like to know the truth. Yeah, it's a deranged story. I it mean, really is. so bonkers. It almost has to be fiction, <laughs> but it's not. Somehow just did not get the uh, the Oscar love, and I'm amazed because the best documentary category for me the last few years has been quite weak. Do I you think. think? Do you think though that that mm. might be because actually there have been many retellings of this, and you know I've just said, mm. oh, I know what you're talking about. It was on Netflix. Yeah, yeah see what I, I mean. I think it will be this one. I think it will probably be this exact film that you've, you've caught. Is it on a Netflix. film? I thought it was a series. Oh okay. no, no, this okay. is the exact one. But absolutely brilliant, very taut, very tense, very gripping. Worth checking out. Can't recommend it highly enough. Okay. Well, let's move on to Sunday. Um, this this sounds hilarious because okay, uh, he just gave me a rundown because I was like, what the hell is this? <laughs> yeah. um, it's called Rain of Fire. It's on the Sony channel 7 5 p.m it's christian bale who else christian bale and gerard butler and, and, gerard butler. and Wait, matthew mcconaughey and matthew mcconaughey wow and matthew mcconaughey and dragons and dragons <laughs> yes okay so this is set a well basically it takes place it starts off sort of now you've got a young boy who witnesses the emergence of dragons in central london they've been obviously un- they've been underground the whole time and when they're building a new tube line they accidentally wake up Do the you mean dragons. that wasn't a, a small earthquake the other day? That was actually no, dragons. No. Okay, fine. Think of it as Crossrail. It's like Crossrail. The construction <laughs> of Crossrail wakes up the you dragons. You think you live above a tube station? Yeah. You're wrong. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we then flash forward to the present, to, you know, a sort of dystopian Britain where dragons have decimated the world. The human race is, is very clustered, very sort of scattershot and str- struggling to survive. Matthew McConaughey's American military type rocks up and the young boy from the beginning has now grown up to be Christian Bale who along with his best friend Gerard Butler never forget that these three actors were in a film together by the way team up to take down dragons and save the world who's in the wheat fields just south of Coffeyville, Kansas it's late November it's a month of mist 
And we were caught in the open. The sun was setting behind us. There was nowhere to run. Twice it came in on us, and twice it missed the heart of us. And that's when I had an epiphany. You see, they have great vision in the day. They have even better vision at night. But in the failing light, they can't focus. Magic out. Normally, ladies and gents, mm -hmm. I let Van run away with <laughs> pulling together this list for TV. I might have to stop that. We soon watched it. We watched it last night. It's, what? It's, I mean, it is, it's naff, but it's fun. Yeah, but you've got to wonder what goes through the minds of Christian Bale. Um, Gerard Butler, I can get why he's doing this, right? <laughs> yeah. But Christian Bale and Matthew McConaughey. I mean, okay, first of all, you've got to remember this is 2002. Matthew McConaughey was n in no way as highly regarded back then. In fact, in this movie, he is playing Woody Harrelson. He's playing the average Woody Harrelson right. role with the big beard and the shaved head. I might just have to go and watch yeah. this. Yeah, and Christian Bale wasn't even Batman at this time. You know, yeah. he, he's the only thing he really had of note to his name, I think. Empire of the Sun. <laughs> Well, yeah, that an American Psycho, really, yeah. but that's it. And this, I think, was his attempt at a popcorn grab. Um, it didn't do tremendously well at the box office. I wonder why. Uh, yeah, it's directed Dystopian by... future of Britain. Yeah, it's directed dragons. by Rob Bowman, who directed the X-Files movie Fight the Future, of which I'm ridiculously sentimentally attached. And uh, it, it is naff. The script is a bit weak. But you know what? There's some lantern-jawed fun in there that I think should be enjoyed. OK. Mm. Right. Well, let's, let's Seven, move, seven oh five move on, on Move on with the, the flight of a dragon. Um, and <laughs> move on to Monday. Vanilla Sky, Sony Channel, 10.50pm. Tom Cruise. Penelope, no, yeah, Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise, Penelope Cruise. Penelope Cruise. I, I just got a bit confused then. This is, this, and this Cameron is, uh, Diaz. And and Jason Lee. Um, yeah. yeah, it's a hell of a film. This it, it, well, do you know what? I think I need to take this time out on uh, on Monday and watch this again. I haven't seen it in years. Um, and with the amount of movies that we watch, it's yeah. easy to kind of forget how, how this all plays out. So um, the, the idea and concept behind it is that it's like a, a self-indulgent I suppose, publishing guy. Yeah. Um, he basically finds himself, um, well, his life in shatters and once he has an accident, doesn't he? Yeah, he has an accident at the hands of a scorned woman and basically the, he, he, he enters into a state of what's almost like a waking dream. He's not quite sure what's going on at any given time and oh, I'll tell you what, hear it for yourself. David, look at all these people. Seems as though they're just all chatting away, doesn't it? Yeah. Nothing to do with you? No. And yet, Maybe they're only here because you wanted them to be here. <laughs> you are their god. And not only that, but you can make them obey you or even destroy you. Well, what I'd love for them to do is shut the fuck up, especially you. You see? Yep, bonkers. <laughs> I love this film. It reminds me of uh, reminds me of an old flame. It, it's a beautiful film. It's a very beautiful, very haunting film. I think it's one of Tom Cruise's best person. It's a remake of, I believe it's Alejandro Menabar's uh, Open Your Eyes. Yeah, and, it was Cameron yeah. Crowe directed this as well, which And it's is very musically styled. It's very yeah. rooted in the pop culture sensibilities, things like Bob Dylan and things like that. Um, I think it's a tremendous film. Absolutely beautiful film, worth catching. 10.50 on the Sony Movie Channel on Monday. Should we uh, kick it over to... Oh, it's also on Sony Movie Channel on Tuesday night. Uh, epic Miami Vice. Yeah. I mean, yeah, what's not to love? I know. Are we talking Don Johnson here? Are we? No, we're talking Colin Farrell we're and talking... the look that I tried when I was starting uni. So, what but year was this? 2006. Okay. He stars opposite Jamie Foxx, who apparently is the progenitor of the actual idea to make a Miami Vice movie in the first place. Uh, he apparently said, I don't to, think uh, I've seen this. Well, he said to Michael Mann on the set of Collateral, you know what movie you need to make at some point? Miami Vice, bring that back. And then he did, and he cast Jamie Foxx as Tubbs, Colin Farrell as nice. Crockett. He's a procedural. It's a bit of network in there. Yeah. Uh, of, it's, uh, it's kind of a procedural upselling. drama, Michael Mann style, very photorealistic, very grainy, very uh, documentarian style, and it is the undercover investigation to try and take down a cartel lord. How fast does that go? Goes very fast. Tell me. Where would you like to go? Where do you like to drink? I'm a fiend for mojitos. I know a place. What? I know what I'm doing. 
this didn't go down well when it opened, to be fair, because I think most people... But did it ga- gather a bit of a cult following afterwards? I think it has. The whole thing with Miami Vice has always been, as a movie, has always been that because the brand is so recognisable, the, the Don Johnson thing was yeah. quite lantern-jawed. You know, it was MTV Cops was literally the remit for the series. Yeah. Uh, the whole thing here is this is very procedural. This is very, an, uh, what do you call it, um, abbreviation-friendly. So, you know, they never explain things. They simply put me onto your, S- your ASAC immediately and things like that. You have to know these law enforcement terms and things like that. It's very procedural, very personality free. Now, I kind of like that about it, but in the same way that the current Netflix situation of Lost in Space has alienated long-time Lost in Space fans, mm. this did the same for Miami Vice. I will argue in both cases, though, both properties turned out very well. This is absolutely worth watching. 9 p.m. Tuesday on Sunday movies. Okay, dokie. Right. Moving on to midweek for you all. Wednesday, we've got Wind River film for 9 o'clock. I'm feeling like this is a little bit of an education for me. Wind River. So this was... Jeremy uh, Renner. Did Jeremy you? Yeah. Renner and uh, uh, Elizabeth Olsen. I almost get the... I go to oh, my Olsen yeah, confused. I'm a massive fan of Elizabeth I Olsen. I love her too. Yeah, she's uh, brilliant. Was it Martha Marthy, Martha yeah, Marcy Mar- May Marlene? Or yeah, something? and I watched that and I didn't like the film, but I thought she was brilliant. I did as well. And also, of course, she's the Scarlet Witch now. But uh, this is Wind River in which an FBI agent is sent to investigate a murder on an in- a Native American reservation, on an Indian reservation, teams up with a local law enforcement officer who happens to be a tracker, played by Jeremy Renner, who happens to have more than a little experience with the culture, knows people within the community and becomes her guide in this murder investigation. She curled up in that tree line and drowned her own blood. Well, how far do you think someone could run barefoot out here? Oh, I don't know. How do you gauge someone's will to live, especially in these conditions? But I knew that girl. She's a fighter. So no matter how far you think she ran, I can guarantee you she ran further. Jeremy ran a fine form in this one, as is Elizabeth Olsen, indeed. But it's all about Taylor Sheridan, and this is you know, mm. his hot streak, having written Sicario and the, the, having contributed to the sequel to that. One of my favourite films. Hell Sicario. and High Water. I know you love that. Don't I love you? that. Yeah. Uh, Hell or High Water as well, and this. And I'm a very big fan of the guy, all the way back to him being an actor in Sons of Anarchy. Wow. But uh, absolutely unmissable film. Okay. Do check this. Good out. stuff. Now, also unmissable on Thursday is Creed on Channel Five at 10 p.m. Rocky, another one of those movies. <laughs> oh, um, yeah. Michael B. Jordan steps into the role of this, uh, you know, as Apollo's son. Apollo's son, Adonis. Adonis, Creed, Because yeah. there's a naming scheme in that family. Yes, there is indeed. And this is the first one. I actually watched Creed 2 on a plane, uh, again. Um, <laughs> you went planes. Yeah, I know. Um, and I just thought Creed 2 was just a good like addition it didn't add anything more i thought this for me was the standout this movie you're gonna have to watch any creed films you know creed 2 is one of my favorite sequels ever is it yeah truly yeah, yeah. I love it. but i think it's because rocky 4 is one of my favorite movies ever. yeah but, uh, i mean you know the return of stallone there's been yeah. stuff on the press this morning about him looking you know he's he's, he's turned out with like loads of white hair <laughs> uh, and he's looking like his age yeah. and it's uh it's it, you know the thing is is that he's kind of one of those guys he's always had a bit of a mashed up face oh, yeah, <laughs> actually true, yeah. he doesn't look like he's ever aged but in this mm. he takes a step back as Rocky it's quite a nice as well as all the kind of stuff that you you would expect from a Rocky movie it gives you a lot more depth as well definitely so on to uh, Friday then uh, 5 star 9pm we've got to finish out the week with a great action film have you finally seen it I've seen it oh my god it's John Wick and Bax has finally seen it I cried in the puppy scene when Helen died I lost everything until that dog arrived on my doorstep a final gift from my wife in that moment, I received some semblance of hope. An opportunity to grieve on the law. And your son took that from me. Oh God. Stole that from me. Killed that from me! People keep asking if I'm back, and I haven't really had an answer. But now, yeah, I'm thinking I'm back. I think Keanu brilliant in this. You know, the, uh, what is it? The Keanuessence or the Keanuessence? Yes, Keanuessence. Yeah. Yes. Do you know what? I loved it. Did you, did you really love it? <laughs> I did so love it. good, isn't it? Yeah, really good. I yeah. need to watch the other two, but I did sit down and watch mm. this, and I thought, you know what? For an action revenge kind of flick, uh-huh. a bit like Old Boy. I weirdly, like that, there's a little bit of a link ruthless, there. Ruthless, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. and stuff. And I, I love the fact that everyone's like scared of John Wick, and who is this guy? Is like this dark assassin. Um, loved it. Baba Yaga. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, hell of a film to finish out the week with, anyway. Friday, five star, nine p.m. Oh, do watch John Wick. <laughs> 
welcome back to Off Screen. So you've heard what's on the big screen, you've heard what's on the small screen, and now we're going to take you through everything on every other single platform you could possibly watch anything on. So DVD, <laughs> Blu-ray, video on demand, all that other stuff, and streaming as well. We're going to kick off with some Blu-ray and DVD releases, and they are kicking off with something that I think is going to be, for the performance alone, mm -hmm. the big winner in the Best Actress category. I think so as well. Yeah. I absolutely agree. So we're talking about Judy, aren't we? Judy starring uh, Renee Zellweger. I'm saying Renee Zellweger. Yeah. Yes. Do you know what? I was confused Reese Witherspoon Renee Zellweger for some reason. Interesting. Because they were our names who came out about the same time. That's what it was. <laughs> <laughs> so, Renee Zellweger as uh, Judy Garland. And yeah. this is not so much a biopic, so much as a chronicle of a very specific stage yeah. in her life, which... Mm. Yeah, the, the year before she actually sadly passed away yeah. and it sort of documents like her move to London because she's she's pretty much broke essentially exactly. and she's thinking, what can I do with my amazing voice to you know make some more money? So she leaves her kids, she goes and holds herself up in a hotel in London and does a few shows and essentially like a vaudeville kind of, th kind of theatre. No. Come on. No, Sid. Judy. No. No. I'm working harder than you would ever believe. Are you? And right now, my husband is making a deal for me that means I can start over. You're not listening. I have someone I can rely on now. Someone who's helping me make money instead of losing it at the track. Can we not? I'm going to get a place, and they're going to live with me. Nice little appearance from Rufus Sewell there as nice, well. Always a great yeah. villain, Rufus Sewell. Love not in this, obviously. Sewell. He's not a villain here at all, but no. he's usually a very good villain. How good is, is Zellweger, though? Well, yeah, but actually, do you know what I think? Yes, she is winning all the awards, but mm. funnily enough, the buzz is not about her. It's about Joaquin Phoenix, you know? It this is, is the thing. And Brad Pitt, uh, in fact. And his but, name badge, yeah. And his name badge. <laughs> um, who, who knew who he is? Yeah, um, who knew her? Um, but what I think about this is, again, what we're going to see in the Best Actor and Best Actress winners this year, my yeah. money is on both of these guys, yeah. is a transformative role, okay? Yeah. You know how I feel about that word. Well, I know, but it's true, right? <laughs> She's completely... She's a chameleon in this. She is. She absolutely is. She just disappears within the part. You, you yeah, don't you'll forget see. that you're watching yeah. Renee Zellweger. You don't see Renee Zellweger at all. In fact, all, my yeah. hubby said to me afterwards, he was like, who's that actress that played her? And I was like, it's Renee Zellweger. And he was like, <laughs> really? Bridget Jones. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's... always it's... been the chick from Empire Records to me. <laughs> you know which one Oh, was? yeah, as in Chasing Amy. No, uh, no, no. You, she looked a lot like the Joey Lowen Adams so, from Chasing Amy, but she yeah. was in she was the bimbo in uh, in Empire Records. Of course she yeah, was. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, happy Rex Manning Day, baby. Oh yeah, <laughs> Rex Manning, love that. And he was the guy. He is your cool rider in Greece too. Is he? Yes. Oh my God. That's him. Wow. You see, it all just comes I together. Know, for I know. I know. He it? did not age well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Michael, you were, you, were a fan, you were a fan of Judy then, you'd say. I, I really am. Uh, do you know what though? It had that Stan and Laurel kind of mm. feel to the format yes, of the movie. Very much. Yeah. Um, I think there's a really nice um, side performance from Jesse Buckley in there as well. I, agreed. Yeah. Um, and it's an all round. It's an interesting uh, look into her life, even though, you know, as like with A Beautiful Day in the Neighbourhood, which you talked about earlier, I think even if you don't know much about Judy, uh, about Judy Garland, this gives you enough to kind of go, that is an interesting tale to watch. I completely agree. So I'm moving over to streaming then. Uh, for the week. Uh, we've got an absolute classic that I have to bring up because I don't think we've ever had the chance to talk about this film. On uh, on Saturday so the 1st, yeah, on <laughs> Saturday the... Almost! It was almost Fetch. <laughs> fetch was Mean Girls. Oh, my goodness! Yeah. Close enough, though. I yeah. can see why you went there. So on Saturday the 1st, on Netflix, you'll be able to stream the one, the only... It's only Amy Heckling's Clueless, ladies and gentlemen. Do you know what? I... I've just, uh, I'll give you an actual clueless quote here. Go okay? on. Uh, what do you think of Billie Holiday? Oh, I love him. <laughs> That's how I felt with that fetch quote right now. <laughs> I always felt like Paul Rudd in this movie. Oh just, my God, I loved uh, Paul Rudd in this. The first half when he's sort of viewed as a nerd and less the, the, the sort of love object. Always always sort of related to, to Paul Rudd in this So this, this for me, I like had the full collection. I had the CD. Did I you? had the outfits. Oh. I had the, you know, the, the, the VHS of this. Rolling and I would just roll in with my homies. Yeah, it's all this stuff. <laughs> this for me is like your seminal movie of yeah. your teenage years of what you wished the Kardashians actually <laughs> like yeah. you know this predates all of that and like before you had the Kardashians and their ridiculousness mm. you know you had Cher with a wardrobe that she would work out uh, what to wear based on like a little not even an app was Polaroids. it it was like did she use Polaroids? No, they were, it was a moving oh, She wardrobe. has the roller decks that's got like an, almost like a touchscreen kind of a yeah, thing. Yeah, exactly. That's what I mean. Yeah, but yeah, doesn't yeah. she say, like, I don't use mirrors in changing rooms, I use Polaroids? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 
And it, also, the late Brittany Murphy, of course, is in yeah, this. Yeah, really good as Ty in this. And, you know, she's your kind of girl that goes from sort of like a, you know, the... the uh, stoner. The, the, yeah, the stoner into the beautiful hot chick, you know, that mm-hmm. everyone suddenly... And then her personality changes. This would anyway, be a very different movie now, wouldn't it? I don't it know Because they do talk well about it, rebooting it. But I, I, I don't want them to, because I just don't know how a modern-day audience of, you know... Teenage girls. <laughs> teenage girls that will take to this and they'll think it's... Leave it of its age. Leave it to us, the children of the 90s. Yeah, indeed. You know, to really love it. It's amazing. Alyssa Silverstone has an age today as well. Oh, she still looks love amazing. Alyssa Silverstone. She's so. great. That This whole film is great. If you haven't seen it, where the hell have you been? Exactly. Get this watch. So, uh, the day after that on Netflix, though, you can watch another seminal coming-of-age uh, film for teenage girls. It's, of course, Lady Bird. Yeah, I like this. Greta Gerwig as well. It's one that really put her on the map as a, mm-hmm. as as a, a director. director yeah. um, Saoirse Ronan, you know, there's a lot... That, these. It's all those great kind of director-actor pairings that we have. So, again, Saoirse Ronan likes to work with Greta Gerwig. We've seen mm-hmm. her in Lady Bird. We've seen her in Little Women. Um, it's a fun film. I, I, I enjoy it to an extent I'm not taken away with Greta Gerwig's direction in this I like what she did with Little Women but for me it's not something to go oh my goodness it's a Greta Gerwig film I've got to go and watch it it's it, not quite there for me but it does have that signature wit I want to go where culture is but like New York did I raise such or at least snob. Connecticut or New Hampshire well, where you, writers you live in the get woods get into those schools anyway Mom, you can't even pass your driver's test. Because you wouldn't let me practice The way enough. that you work, or the or the way that you don't work, you're not even worth state tuition, Christine. My name is Lady Bird. Uh, well, actually, it's not, and it's ridiculous. Call me Lady Bird like Christine. you said you would. Just, you should just go to City College. You know, with your work ethic, just go to City College, and then to jail, and then back to City College, and then maybe you'd learn to pull yourself up and not expect everybody to do everything. <laughs> Sasha Ronan, I think, is genuinely great in this. Also, She's I... She's genuinely great in everything. I get a lot of humour out of the fact that Timothy Chalamet does play Riley's dream boy from <laughs> oh, yeah. Inside Out in this movie. Like, he literally plays like <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, on uh, uh, the following day... Do you know what? We've got a really strong offering on streaming. We, we have. We get so many weak weeks, and this is a strong one. Uh, the following day on Amazon Prime, late night, Emma Thompson and Mindy Kaling teaming up. Uh, this I, this was a bit hit and miss, but mostly hit. Do you I know thought. what I'd say? Mm. Don't. This is the one where I was like, you look at the the poster for this and go, yeah. I don't want to watch that, yeah. right? And then you go and watch the movie and you realise it's got really sharp writing. Yeah. Emma Thompson is at her best in this, and Mindy Kaling brings out you know such fantastic different performances within it, but also something that makes you think. Is that what the world of like TV and late night shows is really like? <laughs> Probably. Is yeah, yeah. But uh, a comedy that I absolutely adore, uh, Friday the 7th on Netflix. And this is one of my favourite movies of the year it came out in. Yeah. Uh, Trainwreck, starring Amy Schumer. I think it's written by Amy Schumer as well. Isn't it directed by John Apatow? Yeah, this, this is the story of, I, said, I took my best friend to the screening of this. Yeah. And I said to her, I was like, this is you. <laughs> That's the thing. Everyone knows someone like Amy Schumer in this movie. And if you don't, odds are it's because it's you. Um, I, t- I tell you what, here's, here's John Cena's brilliant emergence into comedy. Amy. But she's not. What's up, Is that wine in a box? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is this guy ever going to shut up? Mm, please watch the movie. Oh. Stop yelling. That's not right. Don't do this to me. Why is he yelling? Listen, you always do this to me. You, you show up to these places, you put me in a situation. I'm a big guy. Everybody wants to fight the yeah, big guy. Yeah, you are. Hey, uh, Mark Wahlberg, shut your yeah. down. Mark Wahlberg? Me? Who else looks like Mark Wahlberg? Your girl? Mark Wahlberg's like 150 pounds. I'm 250 lean. I look like Mark Wahlberg ate Mark Wahlberg. John Cena finally acknowledged the thing we'd all been saying about him all along. He looks like Mark Wahlberg. Yeah, And they, they then parlayed that into an even better gag in Daddy's Home, didn't they? Yeah, and Daddy's I mean, Home too. it's good that he can laugh at himself. Um, they uh, <laughs> uh, Also, Bill Hader in this is oh, very, very good. as a romantic lead as well. Who would have thought Bill Hader could do that? Do you know that? what, though? Yeah. My best friend said to me, she mm. goes, I, I really fancy Bill Hader in this. And I was like, <laughs> really? And then I was like, you know what? There is a whole audience of that quirky, mm. you know, kooky looking guy who can play a lead. It's like it's taking it out of like Joe from you because that's like a sinister version of yeah. that and bringing it more lighthearted. But if you if there's something weird that you find, you know, a bit unusual that you kind of fancy in a guy like that, then this is the kind of the, the anti love interest that actually turns into love interest. I would say as well, this the train wreck does work as a sort of nasty rom com. Uh, you know, yeah. about a dysfunctional woman tr- trying to trying to embrace romance and failing miserably. But do you know, and I like that about it. Do you it. know what as well what I really mm. like about it is is that actually if someone like Rebel Wilson would have played this part, I would yeah. have hated this you movie. You would have. It is all about 
her timing, yeah. I think, specifically. Because it is, there's a lot of her personality in there. Yeah. A lot of elements are semi-autobiographical and trace back to her stand-up sets and things yeah. like that. And I did have an Amy Schumer phase where I watched more or less everything Amy Schumer had ever made. But, uh, you know, it was around this time. Yeah. But uh, absolutely, good strong week. Really strong. strong week. I'm glad we're back on form because I've looked ahead <laughs> at the next few weeks. And actually, once we get out of award season, yeah. it's going to dive. We're going we to have some fun weeks, aren't we? Gonna we? Have some really, you're going you're gonna to hear us rant. But is let's, what I'm uh, say. let's look at next week, though, because we've got at least two strong contenders, not, not awards contenders, well, one of them is, uh, but we've got two you know, contenders for uh, box office gold next week. Uh, first and foremost, of course, is a return to the DC universe. Yes, yeah, so Birds of Prey, the fantabulous emancipation of Harley Quinn. Amazed that I could say that all in one go. Um, I'm really looking forward to that. I'm going to see that uh, next week uh, to review it. And Parasite. Also, well, Parasite. okay, so I, I'm not going to see Parasite. And I'll tell you what, I'm not, I've now chosen and given everyone the heads up that I'm not going to go and watch okay. based on your mm -hmm. recommendation or lack of that. Yeah. Do little. I'm uh, not even going to go there. I can't wait to talk about it with you. I really can't. But you know what else is out next week? And this got really mixed. Uh, but actually, it got a, a, a bit of a lukewarm reception at the box office, but actually a decent cult reception from critics uh, is the Kristen Stewart sci-fi horror movie Underwater. Underwater. Yes. Yeah. So my two big films that I'm going to go mm. and check out and, and, and bring you some thoughts on is Underwater and Birds of Prey. Excellent. Yeah. So it looks like so, we're in for some fun. Yeah. So Parasite I'm really excited to talk about as well, yeah. but I'll be asking your opinion on that and then also yeah I can't be bothered with Doolittle just because everyone has said it's an absolute mess we'll discuss it yeah but, uh, I yes. think you are rubbing your hands together ready and raring to go on that gleefully one. embracing the pain so uh, we've got all those to uh, look forward to in the in the in the following in the week ahead uh, in the meanwhile that's it from us for this fine week and it's been a damn good week it's been a uh, really good week go and see Queen and Slim please people support please. that film I've been Van Connor and I've been Bex Perfect and this has been Off Screen your seven day guide to movies thanks for listening and we'll see you again next week <laughs>